All right, hey class. So um, I'm gonna be talking about measures of development in this lecture, okay? Stuff that we already talked about in class, all right? So anyways, um, the kind of the last big topic we learned about, um, you know, before this here is, uh, uh, was the history of industrialization, right? Kind of the industrial revolution, right? The various sectors of the economy. So with this knowledge in mind, we must now uh, understand that although industrialization has changed our standard of living over time, it's also led to uneven development. Okay, so kind of the, the big takeaway of this topic, right, is, you know, how exactly can we, uh, can we measure development, right? What are the economic and social uh, measures that geographers use? Okay, so here's a list, right? We'll start with, uh, with the, um, uh, the economic measurements, right? The, the measurements that, you know, um, <laughs> measure the economic welfare of a country, okay? So um, as you can see, right, the list is, you know, GDP, GMP, GNI, um, the sectoral structure of an economy that is right, primary, secondary, tertiary, right? Um, whether it's formal or informal, income distribution, so on and so on, all right? So um, something that I did include here was actually the, uh, the GII, right? The Gender Inequality Index, all right? And the Human Development Index, but we'll also look at that, all right? All right, so kind of the first uh, big, you know, economic measurement here is gross domestic product, okay? Um, it's, you know, the measurement of the total value of goods and services produced within the borders of a country during a specific time period, and usually it's one year, okay? So you see formulas here, right? And you know what they mean, okay? Kind of quick formula for GDP is, you know, the goods, goods and services produced within a country's borders, okay? And this tells us how much production and consumption there is in one year for a country, okay? It kind of gives us a hint, you know, as to how economically stable, right, a country is. All right. And the goods and services we're talking about, right, are both you know, consumption and expenditure and all of that, investments. And this is what you mainly will hear on the news. All right, so I just, here's a, here's a map here, um, just showing you the GDP per capita um, amongst various uh, nations of the world. And per capita means per person, by the way. So, Right. And hopefully you'll see the one pattern that we've noticed all year, right? Kind of the difference between um, the developing world and the developed world. All right, next is gross national product or GMP, right? Measurements of the total values of goods and services produced within the borders of a country, plus the net income from companies that are located outside the country, all right? And foreign investments, right? So it's like GDP, but GMP here accounts for production domestic and abroad. Okay, and again, here's a formula. You don't need to remember the formula. Okay, but here we have, um, you know, uh, domestic, you know, production plus international goods plus services, right, GMP. And here's an example of what, how to um, think about GMP a little bit, right? So, you know, you could say that, you know, PMW, you know, plants here, right, in the U.S., right? That would account for uh, the GDP, right, of this country, okay? Because you know, there, technically, there is right um, uh, the production of, of goods and services um, within a country, right, in the border of the U.S., but it's not going to be in the GMP, right, of the United States. Say, a foreign plant in Mexico, right, opens up, right, it's going to account for the GMP of the United States, right, but not the GDP, right, because it wasn't in, you know, within the borders of a country. So um, GNI here, gross national income, all right, is the third economic measurement, right? The measurement of the total value of goods and services produced within the borders of a country, plus the net income from companies that are located outside of the country and foreign investments, all right? And then minus you know, dividend payments, right? business taxes, right? Complex things, all right? We don't need to really focus on that, all right? So there's a difference here um, that I just want you to, to keep in mind, right? As you know, human geographers here, right? It's important to know the definition of GNI, yes, but more importantly is knowing, right, GNI per capita, right? GNI per capita, right, is GNI, GNI per person, right? It's different than, you know, solely, you know, defining gross national income, GNI. And uh, calculating GNI per capita is pretty easy, right? It's the GMP divided by country's population, right? And this is so that you have an estimated income per person, which is gonna be important when looking at, say, the Human Development Index, right, which we'll look at in a moment. And this doesn't include those in the informal sector of the economy, by the way, okay? So I think that's uh, um, important to keep in mind there, all right? 
So here's the uh, you know the you know basic formula for calculating GNI. Again, it's not super important. Okay, but like I said, you know understanding GNI and GNI per capita, right? It's key because this is going to show us a country standard of living, right? The higher a GNI is, or you know, GNI per capita, right? You know, the, the better the living standard, right? The lower it is, right? Lower standard of living. So countries that rank high feature a high amount of international investment and aid, as well as a large number of international corporations. Okay. So here's kind of a table, um, just you know, looking at GDP, GMP, GNI. So don't worry so much about you know each formula or the formulas for them. I leave that to the economists. Instead, we want to focus on what they mean for the greater economy. Okay, and so for instance, GNI telling us, right, uh, um, showing us some um, uh, country standard of living. Nice. So another economic measurement here is income distribution, right? Um, and this is going to, you know, uncover uneven distribution, even if a country is high income. So Brazil, for example, might have a high GDP or GNI. Okay, but if you look at it more at the local scale, right, we'll see huge variations uh, in their income, right? So this is measured by the Gini coefficient, you know, which is, isn't super important to remember, but it's essentially, you know, uh, measuring the distribution of income within a population, right? Income inequality versus income equality, all right? And the Gini coefficient usually is a value, you know, anywhere between 0, 0.0 to 1.0. So the higher the Gini coefficient or the number, right, the higher the income inequality. And generally speaking, MDCs are going to have lower genies and LDCs are going to have lower developed countries that is going to have higher genies. Okay, so the lower the better. All right, this map is a little bit different um, in the sense that it's not really using the value of zero to one, um, but still we can kind of make, you know, translate the numbers. Okay, so again, right, two similar maps just kind of showing you. Um, the Gini coefficients here. And of course, you'll be able to see some of the, the patterns, right, global patterns that we've noticed um, over here. Okay, so um, another way of measuring the economy, we've got, you know, looking at the sectoral structure and kind of whether or not um, a country's economy is formal or informal, right? So sectoral structure, right, that's just referring to, you know, whether, um, you know, uh, countries' economic activities are, you know, more, um, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. And of course, as we discussed last week, right, the periphery, right, tend to be more, you know, the primary sector of the economy, semi-periphery are kind of transitioning from parent primary to secondary or are already at the secondary sector. And then core countries, right, tertiary, quaternary, quinary. So that's another way of measuring, right, kind of without looking at you know, super specific numbers. Um, but you can also look at whether, uh, you know, just how much a country is formal or informal, okay? And, um, or taxed versus non-taxed, right? Is a better way to think about it. So non-core countries, they tend to have more in non-taxed or informal um, portions of the economy, right? And, you know, again, the informal economy, pretty basic. It's, you know, people are providing goods and services to people. It's not like a formal economy where, as you can see in the table here, right? The economy is regulated or taxed by the government, right? All of the, you know, the economic activities are being included in GDP and GNI. We've got typical professions, right? The informal economy, we're seeing um, um, a country's economy that is kind of outside of the government's monitoring or regulation and isn't taxed, okay? Um, so you won't see formal contracts or, you know, regulated work conditions or, or fixed work hours, right? You'll see, you might see, right, legal products being sold um, kind of under the table work, right? Paying, you know, paying under the table, right? Um, not accounting for taxes, right? You might see, you know, drugs on the market, might see more of, you know, a black market, right? So many of these economic activities, right, aren't gonna be documented, documented, right? And can't be traced. So again, the informal sector is not going to be included in the GDP or GNI, right? So it could be, right, that in some cases, um, some countries might have a greater income than is suggested because a lot of the work might be informal, all right? Um, like countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Or South Asia, Southeast Asia. Okay, and that's the problem now with the informal economy, right? Production and consumption might not be reported and included in GDP or GNI or the GNI. Um, 
another measurement to get another measurement here is you know the use of fossil fuels and renewable energy all right um so you know we could look at energy consumption and renewable energy all right so more developed countries are gonna have the highest per capita consumption of energy mainly fossil fuels all right and the reason for that is because you know you think about fossil fuels coal oil and gas they were introduced during the industrial revolution and pretty much the world has come to rely on that so if you look at the map right think about which country the industrial revolution hit um hit first right first hit i should say okay and you'll see right those in europe the united states so of course they're going to have the highest um per capita energy consumption right and in the developing world right demand for the whoops the use of fossil fuels going to be increasing, all right? Uh, renewable energy is a little different, right? Nuclear energy is increasing in more developed countries. Hydroelectricity is higher in developing countries. And, you know, if we look specifically at China, right? Um, they actually have the, they're actually the biggest generator of global wind power. So kind of a shift to renewable energy is kind of also a sign of, you know, being you know, more developed. Right? So the social indicators, um, different than uh, economic indicators, but still other ways of measuring development, right? Fertility rates, looking at the average number of children a woman will have during childbearing years. Okay, and to do that, you need to look at healthcare, the level of education for women, and cultural factors, like the status of women and relig religions or traditions, right? So fertility rates, as we know, are going to be high in the uh, peripheral countries, developing world, right? And Nigeria has the highest at about 7.0. We could also look at the infant mortality rate, the number of deaths per 1,000 live births during a year, all right? And, um, you know, this is an indicator of maternal and infant health, which is also a reliable gauge for the quality of healthcare in the country. And unsurprisingly, right, IMF is gonna be high in peripheral countries. And Chad has about 73.1 there. Uh, life expectancy, another social indicator, the average number of years a person is expected to live, right? I mean, pretty clear, right? If a population of a country can maintain good health, right? High life expectancy, citizens can work, produce, and create income, right? Access to health care, right? How easy is it for somebody to obtain medical care and literacy rates, right? What percentage of a population can read and write? And um, as we know, right, again, the developing world, countries in the periphery, it's up to Africa, the literacy rates, okay? So, um, Tying those together, we can look at a huge um, and very important social indicator, the Human Development Index. Okay, the Human Development Index is um, essentially a composite measure used to show spatial variation among states and levels of development. All right, so the HDI is a measurement used by the United Nations to calculate development in terms of human welfare. Okay, so it's going to look at various um, economic and social indicators, life expectancy, access to education standard of living measured by GNI per capita. And it's measured on a scale from 0, 0.0 to 1.0, all right? And the higher, right, the, the number, the better. Okay, and again, what pattern do you notice, all right? Pretty obvious, all right? So again, it's looking at life expectancy. And you can see that it's very, at least the pattern, right? The spatial pattern is very similar to this map. It's looking at you know the average years of schooling, the access to education, and again, pattern is very similar to this one. And again, it's also looking at the GNI per capita, gross national income. All right, again, patterns are very similar. So, the Human Development Index, um, pretty important in, in measuring uh, um, um, the development of a country. Okay, and I know this is a little blur, blurry here, but you can see in this map, right, which countries have the highest uh, HDIs, right, and, you know, which countries have the lowest HDIs. If you can see, you know, if you can squint your eyes, right, you can kind of see the GNI per capita here, right, life expectancy. Okay. Yet another form <laughs> of measurement um, is, is uh, Going to be uh, measuring the gender uh, gender inequality. In this case, looking at the gender inequality index. All right. So measures of gender inequality, such as the GII, include reproductive health, indices of empowerment, and labor market participation. So the GII is essentially going to you know measure right. Um, there is a measurement, sorry, that evaluates women's status in a country based on economic, political, and labor market participation. 
going to look at reproductive, you know, health issues, and again, empowerment. All right. So essentially, the GII is just measuring how easy or difficult it is, it is to be a woman in a country. Um, and it's expressed from a range of 0, 0.0 to 1.0. But it's opposite from the HDI in the sense that, um, you know, the lower the number, right, the better, right, the higher the number, you know, the worse off it is to be a woman in a given country. All right. So the World Bank, other international ent entities, right, like the UN, they've all determined that, you know, gender inequality um, contributes to the overall development or growth of an economy. So that's why it's important to look at, uh, at the GII. Okay. Um, and I believe I put a map here. Yes, I did. Okay. So you can see here, um, you know, kind of the gender inequality breakdown, um, you know, across the globe, right? And again, right, the lower the number, the better, right? Afghanistan actually has a pretty low GII score of about, or a pretty high one, sorry, of about 0 0.7, all right, somewhere around there. Belgium's at like 0 0.048, so, you know, that's, that's pretty low, okay? So I wanna break down, you know, the gender inequality index a little bit more by looking at you know, what exactly it measures, all right? It looks at reproductive health, um, but we're not going to focus on that, right? I think that's that's pretty um pretty basic, right? Looking at maternal uh, mortality rate, adolescent birth rate, um, fertility rate, that kind of stuff. More important is looking at empowerment and labor market participation. So, measurements within the gender inequality index are going to look at empowerment here, all right? And empowerment, right? That when I'm here, empowerment in regards to you know gender inequality. Right, it's you know women's um, empowerment, right, including you know the women's options and access to participate fully in the social and economic spheres of society. So two indicators are used to measure empowerment: political representation and educational attainment. Right. So um, political representation, right, um, thinking about empowerment is just looking at the ratio of women with seats in government compared with men. Right, and uh, you know we can look at the United States as a good example of that. Right, so here's an example, right? In the United States, 57 women held seats in the United States Congress in 1995, but by 2019, the number more than doubled to 127. Right? I mean, that's, you know, good increase, you know, but it's still only 20% of all seats, all right? And um, globally, the number of women in national legislatures has increased from 11 to 24.3% in the years from 1995 to 2019, okay? Um, so that's kind of the, the first um, sub-measurement, right, within the empowerment or um, a woman's empowerment. Um, a second indicator is going to be looking at educational attainment, right? It's the ratio of adult women and men um, with some secondary education, all right? And, um, you know, as you might expect, right, there's um, a huge gap, right, of uh, educational attainment um, across the globe. So according to... Uh, uh, UNESCO here, right? Um, I believe I missed a number there. Hmm. Or maybe it was just my grammar. Yeah, it was. <laughs> More girls and boys remain out of school, right? 16 million girls um, will never sit foot in a classroom. And, you know, shockingly, 9 million of these girls are up to here in Africa. Okay. So, um, anyways. Again, these are just two indicators of measuring empowerment. And again, empowerment, um, the measurement of empowerment is used, right? In calculating the gender inequality index. All right. Another measurement within the gender inequality index is going to be um, the labor market participation rate, all right? Um, so this measures an economy's active labor force and is calculated by taking the sum of all employed workers and dividing that number by the working age population. All right, so geographers identify participation in the formal and informal sectors of the economy to make conclusions about other social indicators. Um, but shockingly, right, high labor, labor market participation rate isn't always going to mean that um, an economy is, is fully developed. Um, I mean, you could look at Mozambique as a good example of, of that not being the case, right? And um, as you might expect, right, the rates of you know, LMP are going to vary between genders. Female LM, uh, labor market participation rates tend to be low 
and they're more distinct in countries that practice distinct gender roles. So the role that women play in a country's workforce um, will often reflect that country's level of economic development. Okay, so for example, in core countries, right, women have full-time jobs, right, pursuing careers in the tertiary sector, um, you know, high levels of education, right, as opposed to looking at the peripheral and semi-peripheral um, countries where, where women work in primary and secondary sectors, right, mainly. And, and they just work to provide food for family, right? They work, they might work in subsistence agriculture. They might perform unpaid work in the informal sector, right? Where it's also, you know, labor intensive jobs as well. Okay. So um, another um, um, measurement, and we can look at this map, uh, just looking at the ratio of women to men in the labor market. Okay. And as you might, and as you can see, right? In the um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, right, the developing world rates tend to be more than a hundred percent. Right. So here's just a quick chart, just looking at kind of the summary of, um, of the gender equality index, looking at you know the labor force participation rate, education rate, right. Um, it's also looking at the reproductive health, right? And we can see the values here. And yet again, here's just a, another, you know, um, table just kind of looking at some of the big uh, measurements of development, right? GNI, HDI, and GII, kind of looking at the difference right, between between the, these countries. So France, right, has a you know pretty average, you know, GNI. Uh, human development index rate right, and the low gender inequality index uh, rate there. Okay, and then you know, compared to Kenya there. Okay. So, anyways, um, a little bit more on women in economic development here. So, you know, although there are more women in the workforce, um, you know, Actually, in recent years, you know, as there have been more women in the workforce, right? Especially in a, you know the developing world, where you've got many um, working in you know, you know urban urban jobs. Um, you know, we're thinking about uh, you know factory work and, and in the service sector, right? Um, it is you know women still don't have equity in wages um, or employment opportunities. Okay, I mean we could look at this um, you know this, these these pie charts here. Just looking at the gender pay comparison in 2018, and we can see that um, you know the United States still lags you know far behind um, some other countries, right? And, you know, South Korea, right? Uh, very developed country. You know, there's still a gap there. All right. I mean, you know, we're still seeing, but like I said, you know, we're still seeing economic opportunities for women. Uh, we're still seeing educational opportunities. You know, um, evolve, but you know, still. Um, you know, quality is far from from being uh, being reached. Um, but one way, um, you know, individuals and uh, you know other businesses, right, have been uh, um, trying to uh, you know narrow the gap. We could say, right, is through the use of micro loans, right? And micro loans, um, you know, are basically small short-term loans with low interest intended to help people in need, especially women. So microloans have provided opportunities for women to create small local businesses, and that's um, improving the standard of living for many uh, women across the globe. All right? And these are provided by individuals or you know, non-governmental organizations rather than by banks or governments. Okay. And like I said, microloans are improving the financial security, or meant to improve the financial security of women since you know so many of them um you know often um you know work in the informal sector and might not get paid okay so micro loans are often small amounts um especially in areas of the world where traditional financing is available unavailable because of limited qualifying incomes okay because remember back in unit five i briefly mentioned you know uh, you need to reach be at a certain you know threshold income threshold to, to get a loan um and women you know, like I said, don't get paid since, you know, they're kind of working under the table, right, in, in the developing world, all right. 
Um, but in 2015, a market analyst determined that about 125 million people worldwide, 80% of them women, received about $100 billion in microloans. So microloans, they range in size from you know, 200 in South Asia to $3,000 in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And microloans are going to cover startup costs for a variety of businesses, you know, like the cost of uh, nail polish for setting up a home-based nail salon or you know, an individual purchasing chickens to sell the eggs, right? Microloans might also cover education costs. Okay. And so overall, what we see here is that a lot of women are around the world are kind of getting the sense that being an entrepreneur is kind of the key to breaking away from poverty. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, microloans have, you know, proved, proven to be a success, um, you know, for, you know, uh, large parts, right, of the last few years, right? They're proving, women are proving to be credit worthy. And many are leveraging these microcredit programs to start small businesses to help their communities, not just themselves. Um, kind of the big issue here, though, is that you know sometimes you know unregulated access to money um, can trap women in debt. All right, since these loans again are are not provided um, by banks or governments. Okay, but overall, though, as countries develop, um, more attention and money uh, can be invested in issues relevant to women. All right, and so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they kind of have four keys to the future um, of women in the economy, right? Um, ensuring that financial assets are in the hands of women, keeping girls in schools, improving reproductive health and access to family planning, and supporting women's leadership. Cool. So um, just let me know what questions you guys have on these measures of development, all right? And um, yeah, finish up the uh, that assignment on this.